and welcome to Thoughts Girl Speaks. Today is Thursday, February 20th, and this is episode 265. How are you? Okay, so thank you for being patient. You may hear some background noise. I got all set to record after having procrastinated for three days and being right up against the line of when I needed to record. And so that's, of course, when they decided that they should cut up my street. So, <laughs> don't procrastinate, kids. Yeah. So you may hear a buzzing behind me. Um, and so I was not actually planning to record here because the light record bounces off the house behind me. Um, and so I'm being vulnerable today and letting you see my slightly disorganized and ridiculous game shelf. And also, my wood paneling. That's right, kids. My dining room has wood paneling. I've never admitted it, I don't think. I don't think I've ever confessed. Oh, there's Gus. He's going to show you my... Thanks, Gus. He's going to show you my... <laughs> Very un-nicely painted window that's not been repainted because it's been painted shut so many times that I need to actually strip it down to repaint it. And I have not done that because if you've ever stripped down an old window frame, you know that that's ridiculous to paint the neck because it has like that black varnish underneath of the paint that's clearly made of lead and asbestos and radium. <laughs> Vulnerable. <laughs> but if I tilt a little bit, the light's better. And so some of you might be like, I don't care, just talk. Okay, this is the reason I feel like I do want to tell you these things is because inevitably, if I don't mention them, somebody will be like, um, yeah, the lighting was really bad on this episode. Why did you do that? And I'll be like, I know it wasn't as good, but like life happens. <laughs> so that's why I'm telling you. If you were in the house, I would not tell you. I'd just be like, here's my wood paneling and my backlit self, and you'd be like, hey backlit self, let's have some tea, and I'd be like, cha-ching, sounds good. That's not the sound of glasses clinking, I don't know why cha-ching came out. <sighs> Been watching Alone, is that what it's called? I had to stop watching the farming show, the This Farming Life, because I was getting close to the end and I couldn't let it end yet. <laughs> Such a nerd. The same way with the pottery show. A lot of you recommended the sewing bee. I gotta be honest with you, I'm not loving the sewing bee. I need to give it a few more episodes to get interested, I think, but I've not tried the paint, the portrait paint, the portrait, portrait artist of the year. I haven't tried that one yet. But the sewing bee, I'm just not in yet. I'm not committed. So I've been watching this other show called Alone, and I have a big survivalist, like, like my hobby farming, I have a, a hobby survivalist. It's a hobby hobby farming. I'm like a hobby hobby survivalist. Um, if I were ever to be abandoned in the woods with nothing, I would die immediately. Actually, well, let's not talk about it. But <laughs> like I, have, I would have food reserves though. Like I'm always really curious that why when people go out and do these things, they don't really like chub up before they leave. Maybe they do and we just don't see it. But I'm like, Anyway, but I feel like it's throwing my energy off because now this, the second season, there are women in it, but the first season is all men and actually their energy is pretty good, but okay, I'm just going to bet I'm on the second season. Whatever. It's winter, y'all. It's winter. I'm on the second season. <laughs> and the energy is definitely like not, the second season's energy is not as pleasant as the first season's. Uh, it's much more, like, aggressive and, like, rrr, rrr, except there's one chick who is really, like, bringing it home for me and making it very pleasant. There's a there's a couple men that are not, like, rrr, 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 but some of them have got some, like, aggression, anger stuff happening. And I'm like, oh, you're making me uncomfortable. But anyway, that was, where did that go? Oh, that was the cha-ching. I feel like it's make I don't know, like, watching these. different energy patterns is kind of like messing me up a little bit. I don't know. 
Ooh, that tea is a little too strong. I know I never say that, but it's a little, whoa, it's furry. <sighs> but I, how are you? <laughs> oh, things I should talk about right away before I forget. This is um, Wooly Wormhead's patterns. She has an ebook called Circled, where there's four hat patterns. This is, I didn't buy the ebook. I just bought, this is Circled number one. So this is the first one. And it's knit sideways. It's a fingering weight hat that's knit sideways with some like slip stitches and then they're kind of like offset. So they're not perfectly circular all the way around. So you can see there's like breaks and stuff. And it's Malabrigo, one of the twisted ones. It's either sock or twist. Um, I really enjoyed knitting this hat. It was very enjoyable. And that leads me gracefully into thank you so much for all of your suggestions and questions for the hat episode. Um, I was actually kind of just thinking, what am I even going to talk about? But so many questions that I've actually had to take a little bit longer in preparing it um, just because I was not expecting that. So I'm actually probably going to end up doing a couple of episodes where I'll do like a Q&A episode and then like a show and tell episode. Um, so yeah. Thanks. That was super awesome and unexpected. Um, thank you also to new Patreon supporters and Patreon and PayPal and Ko-Fi and yay you. Thank you so much. Your awesome faces. Um, and then the last bit of like administrati per the Stockinette Zombies is um, I have an, a, a pre-order pre order update in the shop right now. So I just wanted to remind you that that's happening. Um, it'll probably happen through Monday, which is some date. Monday, which is the 24th. And I have four different styles of Aran bags, which I've never done before. Sorry, I'm just thinking. using that one. Did I empty it out? Maybe I emptied it out. Well, that one is mine, but... Oh, because I had to take pictures. I had to empty it out. Okay, really, I was like, did I make another one in my sleep? What happened? <laughs> but that one is mine, but I'll make you a new one. Don't worry. So those are in the shop. And then, what else that's not knitting and so And knitting. Knitting and knitting. And knitting and wool. And knitting and spinning. I finished a new table runner for my little side table. And I didn't use the fancy, somebody is, I'm so lucky. Someone sent me um, the half square triangle paper, so I'm excited to use those. But I had already gotten this one started to piece, and so I didn't use them on there. So this one is less than perfect. Okay, okay. Way less than perfect. Um, but isn't it cute still all the same? I tell you what, like I'm like putting them together, I'm just like, Ugh, what, is, what am I doing? Why am I like a five-year-old? But then I get it all together and sewn all together and then I wash it and I'm like, oh my God, it's so cute. How does that happen? I don't know, but I'm highly enjoying it. My husband is like, I like that you did a pattern for this one. And I was like, it's exactly the same as the other one. He's like, but it shows up more that they're the, what did he call them? Hourglasses, I think. And it, yes, I did instead of like totally mixing them up so that there would be four different fabrics in each square. I did just reverse or change o them. So there were only two in each square. Um, and so he was like, I got kind of offended. Why do I get so sensitive about stuff? <laughs> like I've had many lessons these last few weeks about stop, about like not being precious about things. And yet I continue to be precious about things. <laughs> whatever. I still really like it. He likes it too. I just was like defending my other one to the death. Like what, what's wrong with this one? It's perfectly fine. It's exactly the same except totally different. <sighs> ridiculous. What can you do when you're ridiculous? But so I'm very, and then I guess look at the backing. How cute is that nonsense? birds with hats and scarves. Why didn't I make sock bags out of this? I should have bought someone to make sock bags out of. This is super cute. Why didn't I do that? 
I don't know, are y'all still interested in that? I feel like now we're like in this, like have you been feeling the momentum shift if you're in the Northern Hemisphere? Like I know it's way too early, it's still February, but we've been getting, like it's like we're only a month away from Equinox, right? So the energy is growing. We're definitely on an uphill swing. Um, sorry, I'm distracted because there's a chickadee out there. I really love the chickadees. I say S on the end of chickadee, like there's more than one. Um, but do you feel like the, I feel like the momentum is happening. Like, I don't want to get, I hope so. Because, you know, sometimes you get those 60 degree days in February and you're like, oh my gosh, it's the middle of the spring. And then March is like 10 degrees below zero. But it still feels like that oh, is happening. I don't know, I'm just saying. Speaking of chickadees. So... Every time I complain about the house sparrows, somebody makes a comment about like, what's wrong with house sparrows? There's nothing fundamentally wrong with a house sparrow. Um, I have never had an issue with house sparrows. My grandparents fed birds, my parents feed birds. And like, I'm never at their porch feeders shaking my fist and yelling at house sparrows. Like I don't really do that now either, but you know what I mean. Uh, the difference is because, I think it's because I live in the city right? Like, I'm pretty sure that's the difference, is I have nothing against 15 or fewer house sparrows. I never have 15 or fewer house sparrows. <laughs> because I get like flocks of them and I've tried so many different things to not have so many of them. I think it's just the reality of what's in the city. Um, there are just, I think there are just fewer of the cute awesome songbirds in in proportion to the house sparrows. Uh, but house sparrows are an invasive species. They're not a native species. And they literally will eat me out of house and home. Like I've literally several times been like, I can't afford to feed you guys this month because it's ridiculous. Like if I actually put out as much food as they want, I would be spending $60 a month in bird seed, which is beyond my budget at this point in my life. It's ridiculous. They're crazy. And of course, because they do that and I feed them, I'm like, oh, I'm just encouraging them to shoulder out other native species, but I'm on the fence still about it. If I had unlimited resources, it wouldn't be an issue at all. Um, and again, like if it was not in the city where there are just so many of them, I mean, I definitely prefer them to the European starlings, which make me very angry and that I rattle my window at. <laughs> oh, I had a morning dove who got, something got it. I don't think it was Gus. I don't actually even think it was in our yard because I didn't see it's, something got its tail feathers. Um, and I didn't see any feathers in the house, in the yard. So I don't know if he was flying from somewhere and um, some sort of bird of prey snatched at him but didn't get him because we've seen several birds of prey um, in the neighborhood. Um, oh, but he was he was sitting down. It was one of the days it was really cold. And he was sitting down on the ground. Well, they, they, they're they ground feeders. So that's not uncommon for them to be on the ground. But he was real fluffed up. And I, I couldn't tell. I knew something was wrong because he wasn't moving. And then I just couldn't figure out, I knew he didn't look right. And it was because he was missing his tail feathers. So I went out and got him and put him in the front yard, which sounds terrible, but I put him in the front yard, hoping that there's several feral cats, hoping that one of the cats would get him and make him a quick end. I didn't know how to kill him myself. I really should learn how to do these things. Right? Because then it just gnaws at you need to be better. Any wow, that okay. There we go. But yeah, like right? Like it's like when I get a mouse in the mouse trap that's not dead. Luckily that very rarely happens. Our mouse traps are quite good. Um but oh. It's not the killing of the thing. That's the point. I'm like, I want it to, 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 cause it's clearly not going to have any quality of life. Um, it's just the issue of dispatching it efficiently and so that it's not in pain. Okay. Whatever, it's dark. The last time I had to do it with a mouse, it like messed me up for like a week and a half. It just, now I'm all thinking about it again. It's going to mess me up again. <laughs> 
Let's talk about wool and stuff. Oh my gosh, I'm so dark. Okay, I've got a lot of spinning. Let's just make the break. Got a lot of spinning. I finished. I had a Hello Yarn patchwork kit. And I so it's about a pound. I think I lost a bump somewhere. Because <laughs> what it is is like a, 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 a clear plastic bag. And it's her like in odds and ends from Fiber Club, from updates, you know, for example, if she's dying a run of something, you know, she might draw, die as much as it'll fit in a pan. But maybe that's like four, 14 ounces instead of what she needs is multiples of four ounces. So it'll be like that last little two ounce bump. Um, and so they're perfectly fine. They're in it, but they're all bits and bobs, which is fun because then it's like the pleasantness of knitting a Stephen West marled thing, but somebody else has already taken the colors for you and you just show up. So it's very enjoyable in that way. Um, but so it's about a pound of fiber. And so I have it in just two sections just because it would not all fit on one bobbin. Uh, but I ended up being having about 900 yards. So it's, you know, and I did the wraps per inch. It's, it's about a DK. My spinning is not super consistent ever. Um, so I kind of say it's about a DK. In places it'll be a fingering and in places it'll be a bulky. That's how I roll. Uh, and so I chain plied it. So I just spun all the singles and then chain plied them. It worked out that this one is precious. Perfect. Partly because I realized as I was plying at the end, I was like, I spun and plied this on my Hanson mini spinner, which is like an electric wheel. And I wish my... When I bought the Hanson, they didn't have the Pro. If I were going to buy one now, I would definitely buy the Pro because um, it has more power. And so I wish mine had a bit more power. I'm like, I wonder if I could drill out the machine, like the motor area and put a bigger motor in. But that's a project for a different day. Um, okay, so I was taking <laughs> I spun one bobbin and then took a break for some reason. I can't, I think it was when my motor went bad and my, or my um, switch went bad in my machine and they replaced it and did a beautiful job. Um, but so then as I was plying, I was like, gosh, like I usually feel like there's not quite enough power, but this seems ridiculous. And I was getting frustrated. And then I realized as I was taking the bobbin off, like the final bobbin, I realized that my drive band, which I don't think I have ever replaced, was totally stretched out. <laughs> so the, the the thing that connects the motor to the actual thing that spins was stretched out. So it was not making good contact. And so therefore the machine was spinning way more than the bobbin was spinning. So I felt like a bit of a dolt. But I was also relieved that that's what was wrong with it. And I had another drive band. It was just like, oh, ta-da. But so this one was spun before I think the, the drive band got quite so stretched out. And it's beautiful. <laughs> like I'm not great chain plier because as I said, I'm an inconsistent spinner and chain plying definitely accentuates inconsistent spinning. Um, when you have three plies coming together, they help kind of even each other out. I love the look of the three ply yarn. It's much more rounded than a two ply yarn. Um, it's kind of hard to get. A th it's not hard. Uh, it's a slightly more challenging to get a three ply yarn from just like a random bump of fiber um, because it's it's more challenging to, to keep colors pure and not really muddied when you're doing three plies. Um, I think that's just a personal aesthetic. Um, like my kind of rule of thumb that I think rhymes with Malia, who had a podcast about spinning that was amazing for a while. Uh, I think she her rule of thumb was if there's more than three colors in the bump, then it's 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 going to be a slightly more muddied version if you do a three ply. And I feel like that that's rang true in my spinning life. So I keep that rule of thumb for myself now. Um, so chain plying is great because it, it you can do whatever. It's going to keep the color pure um, because it's basically kind of just like plying a section of the yarn back on itself, a, bit, a section of the single, um, instead of putting three different singles together. So you keep your colors like solid basically throughout. There's much 
There's only barber pooling where you have a transition between two colors. Um, but it does highlight inconsistencies in your spinning. Uh, neither here nor there. I'm very pleased with this because this chain plied section is like super buttery and soft. And I have a tendency when I'm chain plying um, to over spin. I'm thinking it's in the single. Um, but this one I did a good job by accident. <laughs> That's how all of my spinning works is by accident. But it is so soft and fluffy, yet not super airy. It's, you know, it's just, I'm very pleased with how it turned out. And this one is, is fine too. It's just, this one is just fractionally better for some reason. Mm. Neither here nor there. I'm very excited about it. I'm very pleased. And so I have no idea what I'm gonna use that for, but I'm excited. And so then, between the weather kind of keeping me inside, and quite frankly, my personality keeping me inside, um, and then being excited about finishing a larger project, I spun some more stuff. Wait, is that? Oh okay, yeah. So I spun this, this is Nest Fiber. This is her colorway Firefly, and it's Ramboulet, and it's about 245 yards. Isn't it? I love Ramboulet so much. I actually went and dug through Stash to find some Ramboulet because I did some crochet granny squares um, with some Ramboulet hand spun, and I was like, oh, I forgot how much Ramboulet is awesome. Oh, it's so, it's just awesome. Here, I'll show you. Oh, I put it back over there, didn't I? I'm such a nerd. I don't do things right sometimes. <sighs> well, maybe I can show you with this little tiny end. But anyway, Rebelay is so exciting because I don't, it seems like it has such good sproing and it just feels so squishy. Ooh. And yet it's airy, like it's, it's not crunchy, but it's airier than a merino and it just, but it still has that very squishy. Ooh. It's awesome. Do measure it though after you wash it <laughs> because it does go when you wash it. Like if you'll think, oh, this is a, I didn't think, I just kind of spun this however I, it just happened. Um, but you'll think it's like, oh, this is definitely a fingering weight and then you'll wash it and it's a DK because it just like whoop. That spring is just, that's very enjoyable. And then, that's not even all. Then I spun this, this was a gift to me. Um, this is Avalon Springs Farm, Avalon Springs Farm Roving. This is their colorway, Big Blue Ocean. It was wool, alpaca, mohair, angelina, and it's about 263 yards for four ounces. Hmm. It was pin drafted roving, um, and so I don't spin a lot of that, but it was very enjoyable, and it is so fluffy. Um, definitely more of a woolen prep, you get that much more, it's super airy um, and light. Because even though it's 263 yards, I would say it's easily a worsted. Eh, might be DK. It's all relative, I can't tell anymore. Oof, right? So that was super fun. And it spun up really quickly. There's a bunch of like crazy red Angelina in there. Super fun. Good springiness to it, even with the alpaca. I don't mind alpaca um, as long as it's blended in with something, um, with a good measure. But. Uh -huh. While I was on it, I was like, you know, this bat from Knitspin Farm that I've been hoarding for 75 years, I'm gonna spin that too. So this is Knitspin Farm. Uh, this is Cora's Unicorn Aura, and this was part of her 2017 Unicorn Summer Club, which Amber sent me because she's got the most generous face in the universe. This one is particularly 16% Fend, 40% Falkland, 44% Polworth, Silk, and Angelina. 
And it was, you can see the color is just so delicate. And I had been hoarding it because I just, I felt like I needed to make it a million yards long in my head that made it was giving it the most value. Do you do this sometimes? I find this especially with bats because they're so gorgeous and so fluffy. And I think I have to make this as thin as possible so that it is as useful as possible. So that maybe I can get like, or I'll think, oh, I should do one ply of the bat with a ply of, in this case, probably white, uh, so that I can get as much yardage as possible out of it. I have to get as much yardage as possible. And so then it makes that beautiful thing just sit on my shelf for two years. <laughs> Because I feel like I have to find a way to both maximize it and then also not dilute it. And I don't know what that is yet. So I, I just, in this process of spinning these beautiful things and my thoughts about doing handspun hats and like just like release, like there is more wool. There's going to be another beautiful thing tomorrow. Like there just is. And like I need to stop being so precious about stuff. So I just spun it how I want. I just spun it on my ladybug. I find I have much more, I will say this, I find I have much more control of my spinning when I spin on a traditional wheel versus electric wheel. That's, that may just be me and how I spin. I'm sure it is. It's not like you don't get control with an electric wheel. In fact, that's part of it is that you have slightly more consistency control, I guess. Um, but I find it much more hard or much more difficult to spin f fat. So to spin thicker yarns on the electric wheel, I, w I keep saying eel almost, but that's not it. Um, <laughs> so I spun this on the ladybug and put on my biggest pulley, my biggest whorl. Um, so that is means it's t there's putting less twist into the yarn for each treadle. And so I just treadled super slowly and enjoyed the whole process. And that was a great decision. I'm glad I decided to do it that way. So it's only about 100 yards, but it is 100 yards of really gorgeous stuff. Hmm. Look at that. And it was a beautiful experience. Okay. Knitting. Crocheting. So I made a bunch more granny squares. And again, I'm doing these as a swap with folks. Some folks are starting to already join theirs. So awesome. Um, I'm not quite there yet, but uh, so I don't know if I'm going to just seam them together or if I'm going to, I haven't decided, but I am having fun making squares. <laughs> So here we go. Here is some another crafty girl. And this one is like a silk. Uh, it's a merino silk held double with some dark, some charcoal gray. And isn't that pretty? It, I don't know if you can tell from the camera, but it has this beautiful, slightly lustrous effect in with the matte wool. And it just is so attractive. So I have three of those. I have another hand spun one. And then I have, these are also another crafty girl. So this is her, um, her wingspan, her wingspan inspired colorway. And then I have some hand spun that was hobbledehoy. Uh, and it was like a, there were her bats, or no, though it was, this one was roving. Um, and it was, I think, a Polworth silk, if I'm not mistaken. And it's definitely, it's definitely silk, but I think it was Polworth silk. And it, so it's very lustrous. Right. Super fun. I need to actually take some time and like send packages out. What's wrong with me? 
here was I had one that wasn't quite big enough. It's a baby. So I have to decide what edges it gets. And then I have my Ramboulet. What? So this is some super fun Ramboulet. And this one I knit during, I crocheted these for Valentine's because hi. Aren't they super Valentine's-y? Right. Oh my gosh, can you hear them? They're like jackhammering things. I hope it's not too distracting. So that's the crocheting. Yeah. And then knitting, I have worked more, of course, on my Samal cardigan. I need to remember to look up how we say that. By Hohi Locatelli. And it is knit with Brooklyn Tweed Loft that was gifted to me by the lovely human beings at a spa strico. And so look at it, it's growing. It's growing. That's the inside. <laughs> Whatever. It is gorgeous. It is just gorgeous. And so I tried it on and it is just to like, um, I'm not, I usually do shaping in my cardigans, uh, but this one I just wanted a slightly, I didn't want it as like a fitted, I just wanted it to be pretty straight. Um, so I, that's how I'm knitting it. But I think trying it on, it is right at my butt's shelf. So it's right at the place where my butt meets my back. Um, so it's right here. And I think I'm going to do, what I'm doing right now is um, the main body of the sweater has been knit on a US one and a half. So I am knitting it right now. I just started knitting one row on a US two and one on a US one and a half. And then I'll knit the rest of it on a two um, until perhaps I get to the ribbing. I haven't decided yet. I'll go back down to the one and a half for the ribbing. Um, and so that'll give it a little bit more volume. And I'm just increasing a little bit, like doing peppered increases. Um, because of course it's like a staggered moss stitch. So you, when you increase, you have to increase two stitches at a time. Um, so I kind of just did a few around the back and then changing to the needle, give it a little bit more room. It definitely has um, positive ease through the body, um, but I don't think it'll have positive ease in and you don't really necessarily want positive ease in your hip because you don't, unless you want it to kind of flare out just the tiniest bit, but I don't want it to be snug on the hip either. So I'm just giving it a little, I'm just playing it by ear. Just, just like my spinning. I just kind of see what happens, which is kind of crazy. <laughs> but so yeah, it is, I'm still enjoying it. Still enjoying it so much. Even when I hit that part, for some reason for me, it's always 10 inches. When I get from t 10 inches past the armhole, I'm like, why is the sweater not done? How many more inches do I have to knit of this stupid sweater? Uh, and I've, I had a slowdown where I got a little slow, but then I just knit on some other things and we're past it now. And now I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm almost ready to do ripping. So there's that. And then, <clears throat> what else am I working on? So the other thing I've been working on is my, Piper's Journey, woo, which is a pattern by Paula Emmons Feasley. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> it looks even crazier because it's all bunched up on a needle. Um, but it's a pattern by Paula Emmons Feasley, who is, of course, the host of the Knitting Pipeline podcast. Um, and so this this is my bat advent from Knit Spin Farm. And I have finished with my hand spun. And now I'm going to be doing an applied border. 
and I'm going to be using this. Um, this is a sport weight yarn from Beaverside Dry Goods, and this is the Bear Grass colorway, which is just, of course, a very neutral white cream off-white um, and I'll be using that for the lace border the applied edging so I don't have no idea how closely I adhered to the final stitch count on the um, the original pattern I just knit until I had not enough left to do another row um, and then what I did is on my um, I wanted to do two complete rows so a garter ridge of the applied edging color and in that row I just increased to a multiple of the edging um, so yeah because it's applied edging, so you just need to make sure on the final row you have some multiple of that edging. Um, so that's what I did. And you don't even have to do that in your row. You can just, um, like, not attach or attach an edge to two stitches instead of one. I mean, you can, you'll can just make it work, right? Make it work. So there's that. Super enjoyable to knit. I have been really digging wood needles lately. I don't know what's going on. I usually am like 100% chow goo, red lace interchangeable, till death do we part. But lately, I don't know, I've been enjoying my wooden needles. Who knows? And then I have a new thing to show you. Oh, I don't have the pattern name. Such a loser. Isolde? At the end of last year, um, did a color work club. And because I was sick <laughs> in my head, I totally justified purchasing the color work club. Hi. Right? It's ridiculous what you'll do. Instead of being like, um, I have a gabillion dollars worth of medical bills, I was instead... Like, um, hi, I had cancer for a second. I deserve a color work club from Isolde. <laughs> Whatever. Um, <laughs> so the first project is a cowl called the Brunstain, or the Brunstain, I apologize, I don't know. It's B-R-U-N-S-T-A-N-E. And if you ever need the name of a project, um, I typically try to put them in the pull down of the YouTube or on my blog at fatsquirrel.com, thefatsquirrel.com. So here is mine so far. I got the traditional colorway. So there are three options. You could do neutrals, traditional, or vibrant, I think was the third one. Um, so I chose the traditional color work option. Oh, right. And you get, each month you get a project. It's three months. Each month you get a project and a printed pattern. Um, and then the pattern has a code so that you can add it to your Ravelry library. This month's was using Rauma Petter. And so you have two balls of the, the background color, two balls of the ribbing color, and a ball of the contrasting color. Um, and so this one is 100% wool. It is 100 meters for 50 grams. And I really like it quite a lot. It's very airy. It's um, it's not merino, uh, but it's fine for me. It's To me, it's perfectly soft for face, next to face wear. Oops, I'm dropping a stitch. Again, with the wooden needles, look at that. Um... <laughs> I have really enjoyed it. In fact, I had to put it down um, because I didn't want to knit too much on it and be done. It's just be like, I finished this thing that I never even showed you in progress. Um, but I really am enjoying it. It's very squishy. It's very pleasant to knit. And I'm liking it quite a bit.
And then one more thing that you haven't seen that's barely a thing yet, but I did a hand spun exchange with the beautiful Mars of Hey Brownberry, uh, who has a podcast, who is a designer, who is a teacher and an all around fancy pants human. So she sent me this beautiful skein of three ply. It is gorgeous. Perfect colors. I love the blue aqua copper combo. Ah, so good. And so I cast on a pattern that was gifted to me. And it is called, sorry, the Akova Shelly by Sarah Jordan. And it is a fingering weight brioche hat with this beautiful kind of tri-corner decrease that is to mirror uh, the three-cornered cookies called Amantashen. Um, and it is, oops, sorry. So she knit hers with um, a self-striping. And didn't, isn't that a fun that fun but I thought it would be great for hand spun as well and so it's fingering weight uh brioche did I say that was brioche and so the brioche was like a great I love to knit brioche so much and I thought it would be a great way to really just enjoy this hand spun as much as is possible and so far it is now this is the second one I had you can see there's a bunch of wraps there that's because that's my unknitting. I cast on for the size I thought I would need. Um, and in fact, I thought it was going to be too small for quite some time because I like to do, um, I thought I would do a, what's it called? Oh tubular cast on thank goodness because brioche is one by one so it makes perfect sense it's an easy uh, morph from a tubular cast on into brioche so I thought I'd do that the one I like to use is the one um that Jared Flood has uh, if you google Jared Flood tubular cast on there's he's got several cast ons on one of their the Jared Flood blog pages or something maybe it's even on Brooklyn Tweed I'm not sure um on the web the wool's website neither here nor there um it uses you cast on with um just scrap yarn half the number of stitches that you're going to need and then you increase the next row so for example if you're casting on 200 stitches if i mean if your hat is 200 stitches in circumference then you cast it on 101 um but that means that that cast on because it's knit, it's actually a flat one but you could just make it round and just make it work but because your cast on is half the number of stitches, when you're doing a hat on a 16 inch circ, it does not want to stretch big enough to go. So I was really struggling with it. In fact, I snipped it before I even got more than a few rows done because it just would not stretch to my circ. Now, if I was doing magic loop, it would have been fine. Um, but I wasn't for whatever reason. And so, because, mostly because I like doing brioche on 16 inch circs because it's just easier in my brain. Um, but because of that, I thought, oh, it's gonna be way too small. And in fact, I got about an inch and, an inch and a half-ish, an inch, and I realized it was gonna be way too big. Uh, my gauge is just much looser than the pattern is written for. So I went and ripped that out and then um, really could not see, and I find this to be true in general, the beauty of the tubular cast on this is it gives you this really nice curved tubular edge. Um, but oftentimes in fingering weight, it does not show up as much to me. It doesn't feel as interesting um, as it does in heavier weights. So I decided when I looked at it that it wasn't worth the extra effort of doing the tubular cast on. Again, especially considering that it's a pain to try to do um, on these these 16 inch circs. So I decided just to do a German twisted cast on, which is my kind of general cast on of choice for hats. It's a little bit more flexible than a regular long tail 
cast on. So I just ahead and did that for a smaller size um, in there. And this is how much I have left or have done. <laughs> wow, right? So I don't do a ton of one color brioche um, because brioche is time consuming. Every row takes two passes unless you do um, a modified like single pass brioche, um, which I don't like to do. I prefer the traditional one. Um, but usually I don't do a lot of single color brioche because it just doesn't have that impact that the two color brioche does for the amount of work. However, it is a thing that I enjoy doing. I enjoy knitting brioche. Um, and so it seemed like a good way to enjoy this gift yarn to its maximum. And it also makes a beautiful squishy fabric, which I, I like squishy stuff. I might in fact be a bit squishy myself. <sighs> so yeah. Filled with gratitude. Gifted yarn, gifted fiber, gifted patterns. So much goodness. They've stopped tearing up the street now that we're done. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway, I think that's all. I hope you have such a good week. I hope you have, I hope you have such good moments in your week. Maybe that's a more realistic thing to wish for you. I hope you have really good moments in your week. I hope you enjoy your making, whatever it is. Except Tuesday night dinners. I understand if you can't enjoy those. I don't enjoy making those. But I hope you can find enjoyment in your making. Um, and I'll talk to you next time. Bye.